Good evening. If you have have your Bible tonight, I'd like to ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 21, please. It's been some time since we've been in the book of Revelation. I think it's six weeks since we've been here last time. So uh, we, no wonder it's taking us a little while. There's so many things that come up on the way through. Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to have a look from verses 22 through to 27 this evening. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple therein, so speaking of the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And that shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't it a blessing to not be reading about all of the judgments now? It's uh, some really nice chapters here at the end of the Bible. Let's pray and we'll commit our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and that we can find in your word, Lord, uh, a wonderful portal through to the end of time in uh, this earth and the start of the next. Father, we pray that as we read these things, help us to note, Lord, that they are unfamiliar. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and help us to see, Lord, that uh, the things that are written here are by the inspiration of God, help us to be teachable. And we thank you, Lord, for the evening that we have. We thank you for the time we have in your word. We pray that it would be fruitful. I pray that you would challenge us, encourage us, whatever our need might be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the end of the book of Revelation, we have to realize, we have to acknowledge that there are Uh, a number of degrees of separation between where we are right now at the end of 2018 in Australia and the New Jerusalem and the description that we find there. Uh, The things that we are looking at tonight are beyond uh, monumental events like the rapture, uh, the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus Christ, even beyond the millennium and the finish of the millennium, the great white throne judgment. All of these things have to take place in between where we are and what we're reading about tonight. And so we have to appreciate that we're looking at a different world. <laughs> we're looking a long way off through a number of different events. And we have to be aware of that. Each of those changes make it a little harder for us to understand and to relate to those things that are being described here. We take it as the word of God, uh, but we certainly have no experience with the things that are being written. We have to be very careful, despite that fact, not to think that because we're not familiar with these things, because these things are happening in a different world, so to speak, that they are any, in any way untrue or in any way unreliable, because we don't know uh, these things by experience. It doesn't mean that it's not true. To do so would be to arrogantly assert that if I can't understand it, or if I haven't seen it happen already, then I don't believe that it can happen. And that would be a foolish place, especially for a Christian to be. And So when it comes to the future, we have to be teachable, because the nature of the future is that we haven't been there before. We have to be teachable. God knows how he's going to bring the world to an end. And if it was left up to us, it would be a very, very difficult task to justly and comprehensively round up the world. And so we must let God teach us how these things are going to take place. We have to let God show us how he's going to finish the world and what the new world is going to look like. We trust it to God to bring us to a better and a complete world. Imagining a world without a sun and a world without a moon is one such thought that might be difficult for us to grasp. We have uh, a lot of um, 
there's not a lot of debate anymore, uh, unless you go onto YouTube and so forth, about uh, what's at the centre of our solar system. Uh, is the sun at the centre of our solar system? Is it a, a heliocentric solar system? Or is the earth at the centre of our solar system? Is it, is it a geocentric solar system? And there's still some debate going on about that, even though I thought that was settled. The Bible presents to us a theocentric creation. That's a creation centred on God himself. And that's an amazing thing to think about. A creation without a sun, without a moon, and just centred upon the presence of God. And that's the next thing that we come to in our description of the end of the world and the start of the new world, is first of all, the unnecessary providers. The unnecessary providers. Revelation chapter 21 and we read at the end of the chapter in verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. I think it would be a huge understatement for us to say that the sun and the moon are necessary to life on earth. The sun is a great sustainer of life. It provides just the right balance of light and heat. Uh, it also drives many of the biological processes that are upon the earth, uh, so much so that ancient civilizations worshipped the sun itself as a god. Uh, they saw how important it was to life here on earth. And so to say that the sun's important <laughs> is an understatement, isn't it? The moon also is important to life on earth, particularly to um, the regulation of oceans and things like uh, tides and um, systems. What I'm trying to get at is timing of things that are happening in the oceans. Um, the moon has a lot to do with how that all works. Um, and if you think about uh, how important the ocean is to our lives, uh, regulation of, of gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen, and also uh, the regulation of our biological needs, uh, the, the temperature regulation and so forth, the moon is incredibly important. And so the sun and the moon now are very, very important parts of our creation. But the Bible simply says in the new Jerusalem, there will be no need of them. God will simply dispense with the sun and the moon because he won't need them anymore. When you have God and you have the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, you don't need the sun or the moon anymore. And that tells us something. That tells us that the presence of God, the presence of the Lamb, at least provides us with the benefits that the sun and the moon have provided us with up until this point. That teaches us that there are physical consequences to the presence of God. We know that already, don't we? Reading through the Bible, we know that a sinner standing in the presence of God's, uh, sorry, standing in God's presence with that presence unveiled is fatal for that sinner. There are physical consequences for being in God's presence. But the primary consequence of God's presence that's being related to us here in Revelation 21, 23 is light. It says in verse 23, for the, for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof and so because god provides both because god provides light both the sun and the moon are not needed and this is not just figurative this is not just the light of revelation or the light of information that comes from god this is the light that the sun and the moon have been providing it's visible light that's the sort of light that god is providing for us there is a shining there is a glory associated with God's presence. And that is so many times stated in the scriptures that we're not even going to bother to cross-reference it tonight. Uh, the Bible talks all the time about the shining, the presence of God. And this fact should remind us that faith is not powerless. When we have faith in an unseen God, it's faith in a God who can affect the world, faith in a God who can provide light, faith in a God who can substitute himself 
for the sun and the moon. That's a pretty powerful God. Should remind us that when we trust in God for things, they can be physical things. They can be things that we don't understand, but God does. God can and does influence the physical world. And I'm sure that you've got your own testimony of how God has done that in your life. How does God provide money when God is spiritual? We see a little bit of a trend developing here as we start to look at the substitutions that God is um, enacting. We read there in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22, last time we saw, it says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. There is no temple because the Lord is there. Now we find out that there is no sun because the Lord is there. There is no moon because the Lord is there. And so what God is saying basically is, I am greater than the sum of all of these things. Everything that I'm going to take the place of, I am greater than those things. I'm able to fill their place and more. I think these two things in particular, God substituting for the temple and God substituting for the sun and the moon, would have flown in the face of many of those who were worshipping those two things. The Jews esteemed the temple and not God at the expense of true religion. And the heathen worshipped the sun and the moon at the expense of the true God. But one day God will just not have a sun and a moon anymore and take their place. Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, Paul said to the Athenians, In him... We live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We live, we move, we have our being in God. We are connected to God's presence. His presence gives us life. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. I'll have you turn over there. We're going to read just a few verses here. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 to 17. Colossians 1.15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? This is Jesus Christ. Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's a huge statement. By him all things consist. What that simply means is that Jesus Christ is the glue of all things he holds all things together all things go as they do now because of jesus christ both because of the wisdom and the power with which he made them so that they could be self-sustaining and continue but also because of the power of god to maintain and so although we see great benefits through the sun although we see great benefits through the moon it is in our god that we are held together God has, if you'll allow the metaphor, imposed his stewards to dispose, oh, sorry, to dispense his blessings. Now, the sun does it, the moon does it, but one day, like the uh, goodman of the household, he will return, dismiss his stewards, and take up the direct job of dispensing those physical blessings for himself. And so we have to remember that though God uses channels like that today, This is the power of God. So first of all, we saw that God has some unnecessary providers that he's going to dismiss in that day. Second of all, we come across some unnamed populations. Let's have a look at Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to read verses 24 and 25. Revelation 21, 24, And the nations of them which are saved 
shall walk in the light of it, that is in the light of the city, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. The nations of them which are saved. That's a very interesting expression to find here. And before we go about trying to figure out who they are, let's recall our situation. Let's recall what we've been through because that will help us to, recall, to figure out who they are. At the end of the tribulation uh, and with the second coming, all of Christ's enemies were destroyed. At the end of the tribulation, they were all wiped out. At the end of the millennium, all of Christ's enemies through that 1,000 year reign of Christ after the time of the tribulation, after the time of the second coming, all of the enemies of Christ at the end of the millennium were destroyed. Fire came down from heaven and wiped them out. At the great white throne, everyone who was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Let me read it expressly revelation 20 verse 15 and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and so in the new creation where we're up to right now the nations of them which are saved these people that we're looking at must be made up of people whose names are written in the book of life if they're not written in the book of life, they would be in the lake of fire. So the, the fact that they've come through that uh, judgment of the great white throne shows that they are saved people. It's not their nationality. It's their personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through which they are saved and brought through to this time. And it's been the same in every age of human history. Only those who've placed their faith in Jesus Christ have been saved from their sins to live with God. It's a, it's a principle of God's. And so the nations must be then made up of believers. Uh, this expression must be referring to people who are believers. We read on a little bit further says in the end of verse 24 and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it that's into the city and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it as a reference not only to the nations which are saved or nations of them which are saved but also there's a reference to the kings of the earth now, these kings bring their glory and bring their honor into it. And the, the pronoun there for there is masculine. It's masculine in the Greek. So it must refer to the glory and the honor of the kings, not the glory and the honor of the nations. Okay, so the kings bring their own glory and honor into the new Jerusalem. The glory and the honor that comes out of the nations is spoken of in verse 26. We read... And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, that is, into the city. I hope that you're thinking, yeah, I wonder what this means, because that's what I was thinking. The glory and honor of the kings and the nations is brought into the new Jerusalem. And in verse 25, we find that there is access to the city at all hours. They can enter the city and bring their glory and honor into it at all times. There is no night there. The gates are never shut because it never goes dark. And I'm sure that's a blessing for every child here to think that there will be no night in heaven, no bedtime in heaven. But we must address this question of the kings and the nation. Now, for the same reason as the nations, the kings must be saved kings. Their names must be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Otherwise they'd be in the lake of fire because whosoever was not found written in the, look, in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And so only the saved can enter the city. We see that in verse 27 of Revelation chapter 21. This confirms that idea. It says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's 
book of life. Only the saved can enter the city and those who enter to bring their glory and honour into it must be saved. Now some people have said, well, maybe these are not saved people that don't actually go into the city, they just go up to the city. Well, the Greek pronoun that goes with that bringing of the gifts, it says they shall bring their gifts unto or into the city is the Greek pronoun ice. And it specifically means to into. Okay, the idea is that they are taking it into the city. So, if these nations and these kings are saved people, and I believe that that's pretty um, safe that they are, then I want to present you with two, maybe three possibilities for good ways of interpreting the identities of the nations and kings. I say two, maybe three, because I've got two to present to you, and if one of those is not what Pastor Mitchell thinks, then that's the third, okay? <laughs> now, looking this far into the future, having only two possibilities for this is pretty good, <laughs> okay? This is a long way away, and we're trying to figure things out, so... Let's have a look and see what we can figure out about them. The nations of those who are saved could be a reference to all of those who through normal human history that we're living in right now were saved, but not a part of either Israel or the church. And so what I'm saying is this could be a retrospective statement about what they were like when they were in their earthly lives. Uh, people like Enoch, people like Job, who may not have had the opportunity to stand at the judgment seat of Christ like the church has. Perhaps their glory, perhaps their honour refers to their previous lives that were lived upon the earth. And that no honour or glory will be remembered in heaven that is not then brought into the new Jerusalem. And so all glory and honour that may have been earned through a life is brought into the new Jerusalem so that the Lord might be all and in all. And the other possibility is that these are nations in the new heaven and the new earth and that these are kings in the new heaven and the new earth. And the only way that that can be possible really is that these nations have come out of the millennium. And when we considered the rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ, we noted that in the millennium, in that 1,000 year reign of Christ, conditions were optimal for population growth. There was going to be a lot of people born and a lot of people growing and living and not many people dying during that time. Now, while this helped to explain the existence of a sizable army of rebels, despite the millennium only beginning with believers, it also suggests that there could be many more people who that through that time chose obedience. And so the conditions of the millennium are conducive to faith in Christ. It would be reasonable to assume that some who were born in the millennium would believe. I mean, Jesus Christ is there. Satan is bound. Uh, Jesus Christ's testimony is clear. They're living not by Sharia law, but by Messiah law, <laughs> the good one. This is a good time to be born in the world and many, many people would have been saved. And so we should assume that some who were born in the millennium would have turned to Christ. So what happens to them in the new heaven and the new earth? Well, perhaps this is the reference. Perhaps this is what it's talking about, that they are the nations and the kings who populate the world uh, outside of the new Jerusalem. And if so, they would bring their glory and their honour into it. And the idea behind that is that there would be no kingdom with glory and honour separate from God's kingdom. So that God would be the king of kings. Every king would be submissive and supportive of God. Nationalism won't prevail in the new earth, but rather an inclination towards the king in Jerusalem. And every king and nation is in that time, regardless of their identity, the truth of this passage tells us that every king and the nations are going to convey their goods, their glories and honour into the new capital. 
And this might harken back and contrast to what we saw in Babylon just a few chapters ago. Remember we talked about how the new Jerusalem is the bride and the picture of Babylon, that city, was the harlot. There's a contrast going on between those two. Well, there's certainly a similarity in what's happening here as well. Just have a look back at Revelation chapter 18 and we'll read verses 11 to 14. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 11. This is after the time where the destruction of Babylon uh, has taken place and this is the response to it. It says in verse 11, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyan wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious woods, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which are dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. You see, Babylon, which is the epitome of the world system apart from God, it offered a lifestyle to people. And people depended on that lifestyle as the merchants of the world brought all of those riches into Babylon. And when that city crumbled, their soul was lusting for things that they couldn't get anymore. They wanted a lifestyle that was no more available. And so that wonderful hub that they approached was no longer there. In a similar way, the New Testament, or that sorry, the New Jerusalem is going to be a pure but a fulfilling hub. It's going to be a place where people can go and get what they need, be fulfilled, find what they're looking for, enjoy the best of what God has created in the new heaven and the new earth. It's a place where the best of creation is focused and where every person can rejoice in the presence of the God who provided them. And this is what God wanted to have all the way through the Old Testament. If you read through the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about instructions for God telling the people, get the best of your harvest, bring it up to Jerusalem and rejoice in front of me for all of the things that I've given to you. And so the picture is that these people in the new heavens and the new earth are going to be bringing the best of what they've got into the presence of God and rejoicing in God's presence over it. Now, the fact that the resurrection of those who have come out of the millennium is not explicitly described might explain another feature that we're going to come to in Revelation chapter 22, but I think we'll leave that for later. But there is a third and a final thing that I want to have a look at tonight, a third feature of this new Jerusalem, and I've called it the unnegotiable permit. Verse 27 of Revelation chapter 21. Verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is a simple fact that we shouldn't uh, go overthinking. Uh, There is no possibility that anything defiling or any abomination or a lie should ever enter the city. And that does not suggest to us that those things exist outside the city, but that God will keep them out of the city. Some people have taken that leg, but it's not what it's saying. That would be overreading the passage. The reason why those things won't enter into the New Jerusalem is because they will be restricted, confined to the lake of fire. That's where God will have those things. Therefore, none of those things will enter into the city and the gates can remain open all day because there is no danger that anyone who worketh abomination, anyone who defileth or anyone who maketh a lie, there's no risk of them entering into the city. The only people who can enter that city are those who are written in the Lamb's book 
of life. And because only those written in the Lamb's book of life can enter, if we are written there, we don't ever have to fear what we're going to find there. We can be fully assured that the only people we're ever going to find in the new Jerusalem and in the new creation are those who love the Lord and those who believe what the Lord says and will do what the Lord says. There will never be a danger for us. This is yet another benefit of being found in the Lamb's book of life. We've come across a few of them so far. We're going to do a bit of a tally a little bit later in our series. Only those who have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be found in that book. And this shows to us the value of our salvation. Shows what it means to us to be saved. Once we become a child of God, and our name is found in that book, all of the riches of God are ours. All of the riches of God are ours. There are so many benefits of salvation. We might look poor, we might be poor. We might be deprived of worldly riches. We might miss out on the pleasures of this life. But in eternity, because your name is written in that book, you won't have a worry in the world. Not one we should look forward to that time with great expectation that time where there will not be a care a worry in the entire creation and this is where i know i will end up one day i know it hebrews chapter 10 and verses 35 to 37 reminds us of the attitude that we ought to have while we're waiting for that day, because it's not coming yet, is it? (laughs) It's still a little way off. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 37. Hebrews 10, 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now, we might have to wait for his coming, but when he comes, he'll come quickly. There'll be no more waiting when he starts to come. And so as believers, as those who are saved, as those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, we need patience. And patience doesn't just mean that we need to wait because that's not a choice. (laughs) We have to wait. Can't do anything about that. Patience is waiting with a good attitude. Patience means that we choose to act like citizens of that city rather than acting like citizens of this world. That's patience. If we are impatient, we'll go for the delicacies of this life instead of waiting for the riches of that life. We'll feast on ungodly entertainment. We'll heap for ourselves temporary possessions that are going to rust and perish and be stolen. We'll seek relationships with the citizens of Babylon those who love things that God doesn't love. And those who love this world more than those who know the Lord. That's the way that we show that we're not being patient for God's world to come. We're forgetting about it. And so if you're bound for the new Jerusalem, if you know that your name is in the Lamb's book of life, praise God that you do. Have patience because your riches are coming. And that brings us to the most important question you know turn over to first peter chapter one please first peter chapter one we're almost finished first peter chapter one and we're going to read from verse 18 to verse 21 Verse 18, Peter says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. The lamb that's spoken about in Revelation, the lamb of the book, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who came to redeem us from our sins. He came to make a payment. His precious blood that was shed at the cross, he made a payment for our salvation, to save us from our sin. And so that by faith, by simple trust in the power of his work on the cross to save us, we might have hope. Hope because Jesus has died for my sin. Hope because he made that payment, the only payment that I needed and the only one who could make it. By trusting that Jesus paid it all for me on the cross and not by trusting in corruptible things like silver and gold, maybe giving some of them to charity, not by trusting in religious traditions that we receive from our fathers or those who've passed it down to us. We're not saved by those things. We're not made, there's no payment for our sin made by those things. But by trusting in the payment that Jesus Christ made for us upon the cross, we can ensure, make certain that our names will be in the book of life when God opens it up to judge us. When they're standing at the doors of the new Jerusalem, your name will either be in that book or not in that book. There is only one way to get into that city and have eternity with God. There is only one way to avoid the lake of fire and eternal punishment. And the only way is to have your name in that book here's the question when you stand before god will your name be in the book you've got a name is your name going to be in that book nothing is more important than that nothing it doesn't matter what you're talking about nothing is more important than that and no matter how long you've been a christian that will always be true how you lived last week as a Christian will not be as important as whether or not your name is written in that book. How many quiet times you had last week, how you are going sharing your faith. These are all very, very important things and things that should come with salvation. But they're nowhere near as important as the fact that your name's written down in that book. That's where our joy should be. Not in our changing lives, but in God's unchanging promise of salvation. And so, yes, we should live with eternity's values in view. But it's your salvation that matters more than anything else. It's about what Jesus did for you, more than about what you've done for Jesus. Those in the book of life will have, among other things, free access to the new Jerusalem, the eternal meeting place of God. And we're going to continue our series next time and find out what more those who are written in the book have to look forward to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this evening we can come and we can find a letter written from heaven telling us what's going to happen at the very end of the world and how to be prepared for it. Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us all to examine our hearts. Lord, help us to see if there has been a time where we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, the one who has made a payment for our sin to, to save us from the punishment of our sin, if, if we know that in our hearts. If we know that our names are written down in that book, then Lord, help us rejoice. Help us to remember, Lord, that the most important thing is settled. And help us to live, Lord, based upon our gratitude for that. Father, if there's someone here tonight and they're not sure, uh, that, that there may be a blank 
where their name should have been in that book, then I pray that tonight they will consider themselves. I pray that they will take this letter for what it is, a warning, and that they'll place their faith in you tonight. I pray that you would give them the courage to do that. I pray that you would help all of us, Lord, to be thinking about the sacrifice that you made and thinking about spending eternity with you. And so we thank you, Lord, for the time in your word tonight. I pray that it would do its work in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.